Hey everyone, it's Pastor Ken from Bethlehem Wesleyan Church. Um, if you had tried to log in and watch our service online this past week, uh, you may have found that you weren't able to locate it. Uh, we had some technical difficulties and so we were unable to stream and we were unable to um, save and record the service. And so unfortunately, um, you were unable to access that, I apologize. Um, but we started a new series in Esther, and um, we're working through this over the next few weeks. And I thought, what a shame that you missed it because we had a, a great uh, summary, great opportunity to kind of get an idea of the overview of the book a little bit. And so I wanted to go ahead and just take a few minutes and record this, and hopefully you're able to get caught up and watch uh, this here today. Um, from Esther chapter 1. Uh, what I did is I'd encourage everybody to grab a Bible, um, and I would encourage you to do the same. Find Esther uh, so that you can read along with me. We're going to read actually the entire um, book, chapter by chapter, each week um, so that we can get a good overview and so you can see. So it'll be helpful if you got your phone app there uh, to locate, locate the book of Esther, or if you have a Bible in the NIV version, you can follow right along with us, um, but I would encourage you to do that. Esther is found right in between the books of, uh, right after the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, and yet at the same time, it historically fits sort of in between those two time periods. So let me give us a little context of the, the history, the context of, of where we're at in this story. The Jewish people uh, in the Old Testament, uh, they were separated, became separated into two kingdoms. You had the northern tribes of Israel, and then you had the southern Jewish tribes called Judah. Um, about 740 BC, Israel is defeated by the Assyrian nation, uh, the empire, and they're just wiped out. So at this part of our story in Esther, um, Israel is just off, off the scene, out of the picture. Um, around 500 in 87 BC, um, which is about 150 years after Israel was overtaken, the Babylonians came in and they conquered the southern tribes. They conquered Judah. Um, and what they did is they took the Jewish people into exile and forced them to live as second-class citizens. They were, they were prisoners of war, uh, allowed to live in the land, but <clears throat> they, were, they were exiles uh, away from their homeland. Um, about 50 years after the Babylonians conquered that area and after they forced the Jews into this exile, the Persian Empire then comes in about a generation later and conquers and takes over the Babylonian Empire. The Persian rulers uh, began to allow the Jewish people to return to their homeland. So at the beginning of Esther, we have um, a group uh, um, that about... about 30 years previous, they had begun to return back under the leadership of Ezra, and they had rebuilt the Jewish temple there in Jerusalem. Um, but then it would be another 40 years before Nehemiah would return to rebuild the walls of the city. So again, if you're looking it up in, in your Bible, you have Ezra, Nehemiah, and then you have Esther. But Esther really fits time frame right in between these two books um, is where they historically fit in. Um, the Persian Empire that had taken over the Babylonians and, and therefore had inherited the Jewish people in the homeland there, um, they, uh, they were the largest empire the world has ever seen. It, it covered a huge area, the area known as Turkey, Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, Jordan, Lebanon, modern day Israel, and parts of modern day Egypt, Sudan, Libya, and Arabia. So it was a huge uh, area the Persian Empire had, had uh, overtaken <clears throat> and were overseeing. The king of Persia at the time of Esther is Xerxes who inherited this vast Persian empire from his father, Darius I. And Xerxes is sort of the supreme ruler of the Persian empire at this time. And so we're gonna read Esther chapter one. Hopefully you found it by now. Chapter one, we're gonna read a few, um, a few uh, verses and then we'll pause and then come back to it. But Ephesians chapter one, verses one through nine says, this is what happened during the time of Xerxes. The Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. 
At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel, in the, the castle, the, the palace of Susa. And in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all of his nobles and his officials. The military leaders of Persia and Media, the princes and the nobles of the provinces were present. Many times <clears throat> these kings would, would hold a huge banquet and show off their, their strength and their power, often before they would begin another military conquest. And that's what's going on here. Um, uh, King Xerxes had, had been making plans to, to take over to conquer Greece. And so he's having this huge banquet that he's throwing for all of his nobles and officials and the military leaders to basically pump them up, to get them ready. This is a pep rally of sorts. Um, but look at this, chapter one, verse four. It, is a, it lasted a full 180 days, six months. He displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and the glory of his majesty. <clears throat> when these days were over, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days. So after six months, another banquet which lasted a week, was, was given in the enclosed garden of the king's palace for all of the people within the palace, from the least to the greatest who were in the palace, the citadel of Susa. The garden had hangings of white and blue linen fastened with cords of white linen and purple material to silver rings on marble pillars. <clears throat> there were couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and other costly stones. So get this, they, I mean, couches, not laden with gold trimmings, but they were couches, actual literal couches of pure gold and of pure silver um, that, were, that were created, that were there in this, um, in this area. And then these couches of gold, these couches of silver were placed on uh, the pavement of, of all these fine, um, costly stones. And so just an incredible sight to see. Uh, verse seven, wine was served in goblets of gold. Each one, each goblet was served, uh, was different from the other one. <clears throat> the royal wine was abundant in keeping with the king's, king's liberality, the king's generosity. So by the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink with no restrictions for the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. So we have an open bar. We have lavished wealth, decadence, pride as he's showing off his kingdom, unlimited access to unlimited pleasure. I mean, this was certainly a time of, of debauchery. This was a time of arrogance. This was, a, this was freedom to do whatever you wanted to do. Oftentimes, when the kings would throw a banquet, they would they would place a minimum of how much uh, wine was allowed to be served. You know, they'd have a two drink minimum. They'd have a certain amount that 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 everybody could have. But this was just an open bar. You help yourself. You just keep it flowing for this six months and one week time period. This was certainly a a very <clears throat> open, generous, decadent unlimited pleasure time for the kingdom. So beginning verse nine, Queen Vashti on top of the other banquets that were being held, she also gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. <clears throat> on the seventh day, when King Xerxes was in high spirits, in other words, he was drunk. He was, he was drunk out of his mind. He was in high spirits from the wine. He commanded the seven eunuchs who served him. I'm going to probably butcher these names, so I apologize. But look, these guys who were the eunuchs at the time, he commanded them. Um, Mehuman, Bistha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abgatha, Zethar, and Carcass. These seven eunuchs, he said, listen, I need you to bring before me the queen, Queen Vashti, wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and the nobles, for she was lovely to look at. Now, just a couple things for us to understand in this passage. Um, eunuchs, if you're not familiar with what a eunuch, uh, who a eunuch was, um, I heard a preacher described them this past week in a way that I thought was was really good, a way that, that, that could be shared in a public setting without getting too crass. Um, here's, here's the description. Eunuchs 
were men who were biologically altered, okay? So that the king did not have to worry about them being around the queen and all of the other wives and love affairs of the king. So they were biologically altered so that they would have no uh, temptation or way or ability to basically be running around and uh, fooling around with the, the ladies that they were in charge of or that they were keeping an eye out over. So he says these eunuchs, he said, listen, I, I need you to bring the queen. And, and it says, <clears throat> bring her wearing her royal crown. The most likely meaning that comes from this is bring her basically wearing only her royal crown. It's implied that the king wanted his queen to parade herself naked in front of all of his drunken buddies in order to show off her beauty. There was probably a discussion as to who had the most beautiful wife and the king wanted to win that bet. And so after six months and one week of strutting of his stuff, of boasting about how great and powerful and, and rich he was, now he's thinking on top of it all, let me show you my hot trophy wife. Well, look what happened here in the next verse. When the attendants delivered the king's command to Queen Vashti, Queen Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious and he burned with anger. The queen refused, said, no, I don't think this is such a great idea. I am not going to go in front of all of your drinking buddies uh, who are drunk out of their mind and parade around just to boost your ego. She didn't want to be a, pump, a part of that, of pumping up her husband's ego in front of the boys. And so she just said, look, this isn't going to happen. And the king, of course, was not <clears throat> happy with this. Look at verse 13. Since it was customary for the king to consult experts in matters of law and justice, he spoke with the wise men who understood the times and they who were, were the closest to the king, Kashina, Shethar, Admathar, Te uh, Teresh, uh, Tarshish, Marys, Marcina, Mimikan, the seven nobles of Persian media who had special access to the king or highest in the kingdom. So tell me, guys, what should I do? He says this, according to the law, what should be done to Queen Vashti? She's not obeyed the command of, of, the, of the king that the eunuchs have taken to her. And so in verse 16, Mimikan replied in the presence of the king and of all the nobles, Queen Vashti has done wrong, not only against the king, but also against all the nobles and the peoples of all the provinces of King Xerxes. For the queen's conduct will become known to all of the women, and so they will despise their husbands and say, well, King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she would not come. This very day, the Persians and the Median women of the nobility who have heard about the queen's conduct they will respond to all the king's nobles in the same way. There will not be an end of disrespect and discord. Therefore, if it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is to never again enter the presence of King Xerxes. Also, let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. Then when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all the vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands from the least <clears throat> to the greatest. Verse 21, the king and his nobles were pleased with this advice. So the king did as Memekin proposed. He sent dispatches to all parts of the kingdom, to each province in its own script, to each people in their own language. He sent this edict proclaiming that every man should be ruler over his own household using his native tongue. <clears throat> so the king in his drunken, embarrassed state seeks counsel from the rest of his drunken friends. And together, <clears throat> excuse me, and together they agree to have the queen deposed. She's removed from her office and she's either sent away, which some commentaries believe she was just sent away and maybe later regained a position after Xerxes' son, son took over. 
Um, but some commentaries believe quite possibly she was deposed of the way that royalty would normally be de deposed, not just as she was, her position was given up, but she was quite possibly killed for her refusal to honor the king's request. Either way, we don't hear any more of her at, from this story at this time. She sent away. And did you catch the logic? The logic and the reasoning of the king's counselors? So she's done wrong, not just against you, king, but every man is now going to be in trouble. <laughs> the queen's conduct will become known to all of the women. And, and before the day is over, all of the women will follow her example and will disrespect her, their husbands. They're going to they're gonna all say to their husbands, look, if the queen doesn't have to follow the king's orders, why would we have to listen to you? We don't have to listen to you. And if you allow her, King, to get away with this, we're all going to pay. None of us, none of our wives will ever respect us again. You have to save the day for all of the husbands in the land. And so proclaim this everywhere to everyone in their own language, in their own tongue. Make sure everybody understands that every man should be ruler over his own household. And so that's the way Act 1 concludes, the first chapter of our story today. If we were watching this in, in a, uh, as a play um, or as a movie, um, most likely we'd, we would, we would, the screen would go black or the curtain would fall and, and we would begin to get set up for the next part of our story. But so far, we haven't even met our heroes. We haven't even yet met our villains. Surprisingly, the king isn't the villain in this story. <clears throat> we haven't met our heroes, we haven't met our, our villains, but the first chapter really sets up the story of Esther really well. In the next chapter, this coming Sunday, we're gonna meet our protagonist, we're gonna meet our heroes, um, and then uh, the next week, we're gonna actually, uh, by chapter three, we'll meet our, the real villain of the story. But this, this story, this first chapter really sets up some significant lessons <clears throat> that are gonna continue throughout the rest of Esther and throughout the rest of the story. So what I'd like to do for today is I'd like to share with you um, some, some of the key themes, some of the themes that we're going to come back to a number of times throughout our series. Um, we're not gonna dig into them a lot today. Um, we didn't dig into them Sunday. Um, but I just wanna share these themes, give you a little idea of where we're gonna be heading so that as we dig further into Esther, you'll be able to see um, kind of what, we know what to expect as we, we move forward. The first theme that, that, that uh, I'm gonna mention today that we're gonna touch on this coming Sunday is this. <clears throat> our worth is based upon our, our, our identity in Christ, not on other people's opinions. You see, people constantly determine their worth. They base their value, whether they know they're doing it or we often do it subconsciously. We determine our worth, we, we determine our value based upon other people's opinions, from what other people say about us, from, from what we hear other people speaking about us. And, and what happens often is, is that we, we, we don't maybe hear that firsthand, but we hear through other people or we, we overhear or we, we assume people think certain things about us. Sometimes people come right up to us and just flat out tell us what they think of us, their opinions of us. And we make judgment calls um, oftentimes, people make judgment calls on other people's value based upon their opinion of them. I think it's interesting in this first <clears throat> chapter as we see the fate of Queen Vashti and her position there in the kingdom being discussed. Um, one of the advisors says this, you should just give that position to someone else who is better than her, someone that's better than she, someone who's wor more worthy of this title. She doesn't, she doesn't have enough value. She doesn't have enough worth to be the queen 
Um, this verse should make us all just seethe with anger. Just, just the idea that, that the king is looking at this going, yeah, you know what? She's not that great of a, a queen. She's not that great of a person. Um, and makes those decisions based on that. We're, we're going to look at a, a lot throughout this book about identity and understanding who we are and understanding our identity, especially at modern day Christians, our identity in Christ. <clears throat> um, who does, who does God say we are? Um, who are we as children of God, as, as uh, people who have been forgiven and accepted by Christ? We're going to look at, at our identity, and, and I want us to understand that's where we have to place our value and our worth. That is really who we are. And if we allow other people's opinion of us to affect our worth, to think that we don't have value or we don't have worth because we don't have worth or value in their eyes, um, that really is not only discouraging to us, but boy, that can just be so destructive to us. Um, there's also in this uh, story a lot of racial hatred. And of course, throughout uh, our modern day culture, we're experiencing a lot of that as well. Um, but God has created us. Despite, um, despite our ethnicity, despite who we are, um, where we've been born, who our parents are, um, despite how he created us, I mean, we've been created in his image. And if we're not careful, despite people's opinions of us, um, we could really tend to view ourselves as not being valuable in his kingdom um, and really lose the sense of value that we are as his creation, as his children of God. So we're going to be talking a lot, a lot, especially this coming Sunday about our identity um, as we go through this story. <clears throat> the second um, overarching theme that we're gonna be looking at, and we see it beginning in Esther, but boy, it's gonna pick up some steam here as we go along, um, is this. There is great danger when pride and arrogance invades our lives. When pride and arrogance invade our lives, there's great danger that ha tends that can happen to us. So we see this in so many stories throughout Scripture. This is this is this certainly just another time when we're going to see pride and arrogance rise up within people, and it's going to cause people to make certain decisions that's going to bring about their downfall. A great proverb, which you're likely familiar with, Proverbs sixteen eighteen, in the Good News translation, says, "Pride leads to destruction." <clears throat> and arrogance to downfall. So again, we haven't met our villain yet. If you don't know the story, just wait to see what happens to the villain in our story when pride and arrogance invades and consumes his life. So we're already seeing in this first chapter, King Xerxes allows his military success, all of his power to and his wealth to just consume him. And, and then his royal advisors really they just really lean into this arrogance and this pride. And of course, they lean into his drunkenness, taking advantage of the situation. And they really cause him to make some decisions that at that point, they just can't be undone. In those days, in those days, in that culture, many of the kings, especially the pagan kings, were considered to be on the same level as a god. And so when they made a proclamation or they made a decree their word, their, their decision, that law that they put into place was to stand as being the, the very word of God. And so even the king himself could not undo a law or undo a decree that they had proclaimed. And I'm wondering with you and I, how many times have you and I been guilty of allowing our pride and our arrogance to cause us to, to make decisions or say something that later we wish we could undo, but unfortunately, the damage had already been done. We get this even today, how pride and arrogance, when it invades our life and we allow it to rise up within us, that so often it causes such damage that we wish, we just wish we could take it back, and yet the damage has already been done. <clears throat> Again, we're going to see through our villain in this story just how much this principle uh, really is alive and, and how much it works destructively in, 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 in his life and even so much more so in, in our lives. 
The third uh, theme that we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks is this. And it, it, it kind of is similar to the other one. It's, it's based off of kind of the same idea. The excessive pursuit of self, which comes from pride and arrogance. The excessive pursuit of self also leads to destruction, not just for ourselves, but for others as well. In this first chapter, it would seem as if strength and power and excessiveness and pride and the pursuit of happiness and selfish living like the king was doing, this lavish living, like, like we would almost think that that may be the key to success. You know, you get to call your own shots. You get to do whatever you want to do. If people don't listen to you, if they don't, if they don't lean into what you want, then you can just kind of get rid of them in your lives. Like if the story ended here, this is probably what we could take from the story. Look, we should all become heads of our household, right? Live for yourself. Everyone should serve you. There should be no boundaries or limitations. No one should tell you no. You only live once, so so live it big. Uh, go big or go home. Well, this is what the Persian culture taught through especially the lifestyle of the king. And this is what culture teaches us today. You know, if you hold the power, you can do whatever you want and make people serve you. If you hold the remote control at home, then you can choose the television channels that you watch. You don't have to, you don't have to be stuck watching the Hallmark channel all day long. You can actually put on Sports Center and you can be the king of your castle and you can call the shots. And, and so you want to make sure that you hold the power. Well, this is the exact opposite of what Jesus taught his disciples. Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 28, <clears throat> Jesus called all of his disciples together and he said this, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and, and, and they lorded, the high officials lord and exercised authority over the Gentiles. But, but he says, this is not so with you. This is not the way it should be in, in this kingdom. Um, this kingdom of God, that's not the way that, that authority works. He says, instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your, you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be the first must be the slave. Just as the son of man did not come to be served, but he came to serve. This is your example. And he says, he gave his life as a ransom for many. And so he taught his followers to live through his example to live, to stop living for ourselves and to instead put others above ourselves, to live as servants of one another. Imagine if Jesus would have pursued self rather than the salvation of the world, right? Imagine if he would have selfishly chose for himself, well, I don't really want to go to that cross. And I mean, he prayed that to his father. He, he said, Father, I really, if there's any other way, I prefer not to do this. But he ended his prayer and, and his mindset was, it, this is not about me. Lord, if it is your will, Father, then may your will be done, not my will. And so he, <clears throat> instead of choosing comfort, he chose the cross. He chose to die for the sins of the world. Because if he had enough, we would have been lost forever. We've been away from God. This excessive pursuit of self leads to destruction, not just for ourselves, but it, it leads to destruction for others. Again, just imagine the destruction of the human race had we not had Jesus willingly go to the cross to die for our sins. Now, I want us to understand, this doesn't mean that we don't ever do stuff for ourselves. I know there's times we just need to get away and have a, a, a me day. We, we got to get away and do things. And, we, and I think it's healthy for us to, to take care of ourselves so that we can take care of others. If we don't take care of ourselves, we won't be able to take care of others. So I want to make sure that we understand this, that I'm not suggesting we just totally throw away um, our own self-care, um, our own uh, taking care of our own needs. Those things have to be done. But it's this excessive pursuit of self. It's this idea that nobody else matters but us. It's that idea that we're always taking first place, that we're always allowing our needs to go before the needs of others. When we begin that pursuit of it's always about me, 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 it's my, 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 it's always about my interest, 
then that is going to lead to some self-destruction and boy, it's going to destroy families, it's gonna destroy relationships, it's gonna destroy churches, it's gonna destroy uh, communities. That excessive pursuit of self leads to destruction for ourselves and for others. And we're gonna see, again, we're gonna see that throughout this story. <clears throat> the fourth theme that I wanna to mention today is this. When God seems the most silent, is when we must learn to trust in his sovereignty the most. Sovereignty simply means that nothing happens outside of the scope and knowledge of God. He has his hand on things and nothing is out of his control. We have to trust in his sovereignty that he is in control of all things, even when he seems silent. There are two books of the Bible that never mention God by name. One is Song of Solomon, and the second is, you guessed it, the book of Esther. But just because God's name is never mentioned in this book does not mean that his influence and his work is not seen. The same way in our own lives, there are seasons when it seems that God goes silent on us. There are seasons of life where it can be easy to wonder if God really exists, and if he does, does he know anything about what's going on in our lives? And if he does know what's going on in our lives, does he even care? Because during these seasons, it just seems like uh, our prayers can't get through and it seems like we just don't feel him, which seems like he's just not speaking, he's silent. And so one of the things I want us to discuss over the next few weeks is, is how to trust him when it seems that he does go silent. To trust in his sovereignty means that we learn that God is ultimately in control and he'll put us in the right place at the right time. <clears throat> the most well-known verse in Esther, in fact, the key verse, the theme verse of Esther, and one that you're likely familiar with, you may not have even known came from this book. It comes from chapter four, verse 14, where uh, we, we see uh, Mordecai say to Esther, who knows but that maybe you have come to royal position for such a time as this. And as you see this story and as you see the pieces come together, the, the truth is these things did not just happen by chance. These things were not just by coincidence. Neither were they all the work of human beings putting them together. There were things that came together that no human could have orchestrated but we see God's hand and his working throughout this story of Esther. And I want us to understand and see as we go through the next few weeks, I want us to understand and see God's hand working in our lives as well. He's working in your life and my life in ways that we may not see, understand, feel, or sense. He seems silent, but we've got to trust his sovereignty that he is indeed working behind the scenes. And then finally, the last major theme that we're gonna be looking at throughout this series. I'm sure there's other themes, there's other things that can be discussed, but the final thing that we're gonna discuss through the series is this. <clears throat> there is great wisdom that is needed in order to find a balance between taking a stand against evil and surviving in a broken world. It can be quite challenging to, to have to strike that balance, but there, there is wisdom that we need and, and we can achieve that and receive that wisdom from God to be able to find, to strike that balance when we live in a broken world like we live in. There's some that believe that as Christians, culture is bad and it's just completely evil and, and, and they believe that we should constantly just be fighting everything. That's our goal. That's our responsibility as Christians is to, to fight against culture and, and, and to, to make things right in our culture and our society today. Again, Jesus never taught that to his disciples. In fact, he and, his, he and the New Testament authors often taught the exact opposite. Jesus said this, there, there are gonna be some things that Caesar asks of you and you've got to render to Caesar that which belongs to Caesar. You may not like it. He said, but you, know, you may not like paying taxes, but you gotta pay your taxes. There may be some things you have to be obedient to that you have to subject yourself to. There may be some laws of man that, that you don't like, but you have to go ahead and render to Caesar those things that belong to Caesar, but make sure you render to God those things that belong to God. Uh, the, the, 
the other authors of the New Testament, Paul in particular, he, he teaches uh, in, in the letters that he wrote to the churches, um, the Christian churches, that, that they were to, as Christians, obey those in authority because God has placed them in authority over our lives. We may not always like the rules and the laws, but we need to obey and not even just obey, but pray for our leaders that have been placed in authority. Matthew 10, 16, Jesus says it this way. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. You know, I know that it's it's risky out there. I know that there's wolves that are out there seeking to, to tear up and devour. And, and I know I'm sending you out as a sheep among those wolves. Um, he doesn't tell us to just stay stay huddled up in the in the safety of the pen. He says, I'm sending you out into this world. And he says this, so therefore be as shrewd as snakes. <laughs> have some wisdom, have some discernment. Um, you know, understand that there's gonna have to be some shrewdness involved, um, but also you need to be innocent as doves. And this story of Esther, as, as you, as we work through this and you see what takes place here, Esther shows how one can live as sheep among wolves. She talks, you know, we're going to learn through the story how to live in an evil and debauchery filled society, how to be shrewd as a snake and yet as innocent as doves, as doves. We're going to dig deeper into this as we go along. Um, but it's going to just be important for us to, to find that balance. How do we live knowing this is a broken world and, and there's sinfulness in this world and there's laws in this world and there's things that happen in this world that we don't like, but we, this is just part of the brokenness. And then to realize that there are though some times that we need to take a stand. And we have to have the wisdom and discernment to realize when has the line <clears throat> in the sand been crossed? When, when has, as have we compromised to the point where we have to say, no, this is beyond our ability to compromise? We've got to be able to find that balance. Living, knowing that we're living in a broken world, knowing that we, we belong to another kingdom. We're just passing through this kingdom. Um, Esther, Esther lived in this culture, in this society, but that wasn't her homeland. That wasn't her people. That wasn't where she really belonged, but she did what she had to do living in a pagan culture. I think it's interesting. In the Old Testament, you see a lot of Old Testament characters living, living in a pagan culture. I mean, how great would it be if we lived in a Christian nation today, a, a nation that, that loved God and loved God's laws and followed God's laws, but that's not the case. And I don't believe we'll ever live in such a culture and society. I, I don't know that Christ expects us to fight for that culture and society. I think we've been pretty much given the understanding that we live in a broken world, a sinful world, a world that God is looking to redeem, but he's gonna do it through his kingdom, not the kingdoms of this world. And so we're gonna be, as we dig in, I'm excited about this, I'm excited about this study uh, over the next few weeks. We're looking at ancient book <clears throat> from a culture 2,500 years ago. And we're looking at some characters that lived in, a, in, in that pagan culture of the Persians. Um, but even through that story, this 2,500-year-old story, the same God that delivered Esther and her people back then is the same God who promises to deliver us. And I believe that you're gonna see some of these principles that we're talking about um, that, that we're gonna learn from this story is gonna be applicable indeed for us on our Christian journey as well. And so I'm excited to take this journey through Esther with you. Again, thanks for watching this uh, uh, recap of Sunday's sermon. Uh, hopefully you'll be, you'll be up to speed. And this coming Sunday as we delve into chapter two, we really look forward to seeing you either in person or online uh, next week. But may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May his face shine upon you. And until we see you again, may the peace of Christ go with you. My brothers and sisters, love you. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.